and to today's webinar. Okay, just advance that slide, um, where we're going to be talking about partnering with juvenile justice agencies for suicide prevention. Um, we had about 60 people register for the webinar today, and we're just really thrilled to have you join us um, to talk about this topic. Um, I know that there are a number of grantees um, at the state uh, and tribal level who are either doing work in this area, um, want to be doing work in this area, um, or you know are kind of in the process of figuring out um, how that might work with um, the work that they are already doing. So I would like to welcome you, and I would like to welcome our presenters. We have um, several presenters with us today, and we're really thrilled to have them with us. Um, you'll be hearing from them in this order. First, we have Simone um, Gonsolin. I hope that I pronounced your last name correctly. Um, he's a principal research analyst with the American Institutes for Research, and he is also on the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention's Juvenile Justice Task Force. And he's going to be talking about um, an overview of the task force's work and some of the anticipated products um, that you will be able to um, receive uh, from the task force in the very near future. Um, and then after um, Simone, we're going to hear from Adam Lesser and Sally Vander Stratton from Georgia's Garrett Lee Smith um, program. They're going to be talking about the um, established partnership that has been in place between the um, mental health agency at the state level and the juvenile justice um, state agency and how that came into being um, and how that's really developed um, and, and been maintained over time. And then we'll hear from Ligia Williams with the Tennessee Lives Count GLS program. Um, she's going to be talking about the curriculum that was developed for um, st correction staff in juvenile justice agencies, um, and it's called the Shield of Care. And so she'll be talking um, about that, and it's a really exciting um, product and, and was a while in the making. So um, you'll get to hear about that more in detail. So without further ado, um, we do have kind of a packed agenda today. Um, but like I said, these are our presenters. Um, you'll be seeing their pictures throughout. Um, and I am going to turn the virtual floor over to Simone at this point. Thank you, Gail. And you did an excellent job on the pronunciation of my last name. Good job. It's it's great to be with uh, all of the presenters and also the participants, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and talk to you a little bit about the work the Suicide Prevention Task Force has been engaged in over the last several months. Uh, the National Action Alliance uh, for Suicide Prevention and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention recognized uh, that there are populations of youth where suicide is more prevalent uh, than the general population. Uh, the population of youth um, who are involved in the juvenile justice system were certainly a special population that continuously came up in the discussion uh, within the alliance. Uh, hence, uh, there was the establishment of the Suicide Prevention Task Force to really better address the needs of youth who are in contact uh, with the juvenile justice system. You know, you, you may ask why this particular population is a population that we're focusing on. And of course, as, as many of you, there are many of you who are involved in the juvenile justice system know, the research is pretty clear uh, that youth involved with the justice system have a higher risk of suicide when compared to youth in the general population. And residential facilities um, have, a, have nearly three times, or youth that are in residential facilities uh, have nearly three times the rate of suicide compared to their peers in the general population. So we're talking about kids who are really in the deep end of the system there. And then also uh, with youth who are in juvenile confinement, it is the leading cause uh, of death. Um, a couple of uh, points here uh, pertaining to some studies that were, that were done uh, over the last several years. Um, youth who died by suicide while in custody, uh, there was typically a history of mental health concerns or substance abuse disorders. Uh, some of which these, the mental health concerns and substance abuse disorders were addressed through treatment, some were not. Uh, also, they found that 50% uh, were on room confinement when uh, they did uh, actually die from the suicide attempt. Uh, and then according to a study that's um, been done in the state of Utah, most youth who died by suicide had prior contact with the juvenile justice system 
uh, and also experienced uh, legal problems as well as school disciplinary issues uh, as well. So as, as the task force pulled together to uh, address the needs of youth and of, of agencies who are providing services for youth uh, in the juvenile justice system, we established two main goals uh, for the work. Uh, the first goal of the task force was to promote uh, uh, awareness, not only among the people who are working in the field of, of juvenile justice, but also the public at large. Uh, because we know many times they are stakeholders who can really impact policy and practices. So we wanted to make sure that that work got out to a larger group than, than folks who work within the juvenile justice system. Also, we wanted to uh, <clears throat> talk about the increased risk of suicide and suicidal behaviors amongst youth in the system, and also that uh, suicide within this targeted population is absolutely preventable. Uh, and uh, so that's certainly one of the goals of the task force. The second goal was to support research <clears throat> both uh, on suicide and suicide prevention, uh, initiatives, strategies, and activities for youth in contact with the juvenile justice uh, system. So, you know, it's going beyond just awareness and uh, getting the word out there, but really look at what's needed uh, research-wise, and then also to look at current initiatives, strategies, and activities that are really doing a good job of addressing uh, the needs of kids in the system. So given these goals, the task force created four small uh, work groups or subcommittees uh, based on the conversation of this larger task force. And the four uh, subcommittees uh, really gathered around uh, these four particular areas for our work and conversation. The first one was public awareness and education. Uh, suicide research, suicide prevention training, and of course model programs that are in operation across the country. And then finally, um, how mental health and juvenile justice systems can do a better job of collaborating to address the needs of youth uh, who, are, who are in the juvenile justice system, especially those youth who have uh, emotional concerns uh, that may lead to suicidal behaviors. Um, so this group was basically facilitated by Joe Cocosa, the National Center on Mental Health and Juvenile Justice, and Steffi Rapp from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. They pulled together um, individuals from a pretty diverse background to make up the membership of these uh, four uh, task force subcommittees. Uh, individuals come from uh, executive directors of national organizations, researchers, uh, the foundation arena, uh, practitioners in related fields, federal agency participation uh, was also evident uh, in the work groups, <clears throat> and then also technical assistance providers. So if you look at this first subgroup, public awareness and education, uh, we wanted to identify for you today the objectives and the purpose of the particular work group, and then what were some of the accomplishments. Uh, and I'll share with you uh, at the end of my presentation uh, when these publications will be available for, uh, for your use. But the objective of this particular subcommittee was to promote awareness uh, among individuals within the field as well as the general population on, on the increased risk of suicide and suicidal behaviors uh, for youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system, but also to ensure them that this, uh, there, there are uh, targeted uh, models and strategies folks can put in place uh, because suicide is certainly preventable within the population of, of youth that we work with. So a couple of the accomplishments uh, of this work group, they've identified uh, the need for fact sheets. These are very quick, uh, uh, heavily laden uh, uh, one-pagers uh, that uh, are focused on um, particular uh, individuals who work within the justice system or work with youth in the justice system. So there's a fact sheet dedicated to juvenile court personnel, to probation staff, uh, detention or correctional staff, as well as administrators. Uh, and then also uh, they want to ensure that these are fact sheets that can be used for uh, individuals as they um, uh, convene conferences or meetings as part of the awareness and education uh, function of this particular work group. Also this work group uh, will host uh, and participate in webinars over the next uh, several months. The second uh, work group uh, was the Suicide Research Subcommittee, and uh, the 
objective was to support and promote research in the area of suicide and suicide prevention, of course. The accomplishments of this group were pretty extensive. Uh, they reviewed uh, suicide prevention programs around the country in suicidal screening and assessment tools. They pulled this information together in, in a paper, in a white paper, uh, also covering uh, the prevalence of suicide, ideation, and behavior among youth within the juvenile justice system. They created a prevalence table uh, based on uh, the current research specific to suicidal behavior amongst this population. And then also they identified what they felt as over the major gaps uh, within research. And then also uh, they uh, recommended future research uh, opportunities or options that should be considered uh, down the line uh, so that uh, might impact the field uh, to a greater extent. The third, <coughs> excuse me, the third work group or subcommittee uh, dealt with mental, uh, uh, dealt with uh, suicide prevention training and programs, and uh, their objective is basically to promote uh, and, and develop implementation of suicide prevention programs in facilities uh, and to identify effective training programs across the country. So not only uh, identifying uh, uh, programs that were effective as far as training staff to recognize uh, some, uh, some pre-suicidal behaviors, but also how to engage with youth who have a history of uh, suicidal uh, behavior so that we can avoid uh, any, any sort of uh, incident happening when young, youngsters are involved in the juvenile justice system. So the work uh, basically centered around um, uh, a well-known uh, seminal piece developed by Lindsay Hayes uh, entitled The Guide to Developing and Revising Suicide Prevention Protocols for Juvenile Justice Facilities. They looked at those key points of contact in the juvenile justice system, you know, ranging from a time of arrest to placement, uh, to placement in either detention or in a secure care facility, uh, whether or not a youngster was in a diversion program, uh, all the way through reentry and applied um, uh, those particular key uh, points of contact with programs and training that were out there in the field to really help to build a more robust curriculum that uh, agencies and personnel might be able to be engaged in in addressing uh, the, the needs of youth who, who uh, have attempted suicide or uh, there is certainly the implication that there may be a suicidal attempt. Uh, they created an inventory of programs around the country. Uh, they developed the model training curriculum, as I said, and they've already uh, held two webinars that were sponsored by the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators on this particular topic. The final work group, a subcommittee, uh, worked on, was entitled the Mental Health and Juvenile Justice System Collaboration, and uh, the objective was to improve collaboration strategies between mental health uh, and the juvenile justice system uh, to move uh, the field, uh, the field's awareness uh, to a different level and develop and promote effective clinical and professional practices uh, across the country. So the accomplishments uh, that were involved with this, with this particular work group is to uh, look, they looked at proven collaborative strategies and models uh, and developed a guide uh, for mental health and juvenile justice agencies that basically provides uh, recommendations or guidance on effective collaboration uh, that ex specifically addresses suicide prevention. Uh, there is a document that, that will be published uh, through this work group and it's entitled Strategies Mental Health and Juvenile Justice Agencies May Employ to Improve Collaboration and Promote Suicide Prevention. Uh, we've completed a crosswalk of the strategies and recommendations for just a quick reference uh, for individuals and for agencies, and then we also developed a self-assessment tool to assist juvenile justice agencies to support uh, collaboration across other child-serving agencies to address uh, youth suicide via sort of SWOT framework that addresses strengths and opportunities, weaknesses and threats to the collaborative effort, uh, action steps that are necessary to move the initiative forward, and ultimately indicators and benchmarks to assess progress on collaboration. And finally, 
Uh, all of these documents will be disseminated in January of 2013. They're currently with editing right now. Uh, and if you do need additional information on the task force, certainly Jason uh, can give you information, but Steffi Rapp is the Juvenile Justice Specialist with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Her contact information is there, as well as the task force's webpage on the Action Alliance's website. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to participate in today's webinar, and I'll turn it over to uh, Adam. All right. Thanks very much for that task force overview, Simone. Um, before we move on, we wanted to pose a question to the group uh, that you can respond to via the chat box. And um, Dominique, if you could pull that up real quick. All right, so as you can see, the question is, what might be a good first step in collaborating with the juvenile justice agencies in your state or community? And you can use the chat box to the right of the question to chat in your response. I see we've got Jackie typing right now. James, a couple people. And this is Gail. I know that um, since a number of you are already doing work in this area, um, we should be able to get a number of responses um, in here about um, either first steps that you took um, or that your colleagues may have taken in order to start collaborating with JJ agencies. Um, or, you know, sort of looking back at maybe some relationship that predates you. Um, you know, sort of knowing what your predecessors may have done. Um, and it looks like we're starting to get some answers in. Jackie's typed in, asking a juvenile justice agency rep to participate on your advisory committee or board. Thanks. James has said, starting the conversation with those who already are conducting policy or protocol development. A couple more people typing. Karen's chatted in, inviting certain staff to safe talk or assist trainings, including them on coalitions. Adam and Sally have said, meet with local law enforcement officers who work with youth. Great. And we're going to hear more from the two of them um, about that in greater detail um, just as soon as we wrap up this chat here. Deborah has chatted in, collaborate with other suicide prevention task forces to share contacts and activities in progress. I think these are all some really um, great first steps, and obviously, um, you know, a lot of it depends on, um, you know, climate and politics and relationships um, that may or may not already be in place um, in your state or in your community. Um, so there's there's really sort of no right or wrong answer here. Um, it's a matter of um, of sort of figuring out how to get your foot in the door um, a lot of times and sort of figure out um, how you can uh, help each other um, to meet certain needs and wants that are identified. So I see we still have a couple of people typing, and then we're going to um, transition to um, Adam Lesser and Sally Vander um, Stratton. I see James has said, um, inviting yourself to an annual conference um, or meeting, which is always a great way, I think, to do some networking. And Simone has said, establish interagency agreements that formalize these relationships and allow for sharing of data and information. All right. Thanks, everyone. Ooh, I see a few more people getting those last few comments in. Deborah said working with county teams from Child Death Review. All right. <coughs> and Nettie, the last comment here, work with other coalitions or groups that work with youth programs. So some collaboration there. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for participating in the chat. I'd now like to move the presentation along and go to Adam and Sally, who are going to tell us about partnerships for working 
uh, with juvenile justice settings. So go ahead, um, Adam and Sally. Okay, this is Sally. I'm going to start off, and Adam and I will um, kind of uh, piggyback on each other. I want to thank um, all of you for inviting us as well. We really appreciate the opportunity to share the work that we've been doing. Um, I first want to orient you to our suicide prevention program. The program was actually established by the legislature in 2006, and it had been advocated for for um, a number of years um, by our folks in Georgia. And we actually had developed our plan, our suicide prevention plan, before the program came out in uh, 2001. Uh, the key activities uh, that um, the suicide prevention program does, some of which are actually legislated and bullet points in the legislation, are awareness and stigma reduction, community and gatekeeper training, training professionals, organizing community coalitions, organizing prevention in our systems of care, and surveillance. And the Garrett Lee Smith uh, Youth Suicide Prevention Program became a part of the overall suicide prevention program with the award of our initial grant in 2008. And um, we had an extension on that grant. Uh, and then we have a second award made in August of 2012. The um, suicide prevention coordinator, me, manages the state-funded activities, and Adam manages the Garrett Lee Smith program. And we often work together on joint projects, and this is one of those. The suicide prevention program is actually broken into four parts. The first is community services, where we do um, our basic services. The second is interagency services where we uh, basically have the opportunity to replicate what we do in the community with specific other agencies in the state. Our surveillance services, which are our data gathering, building uh, surveillance systems, uh, which actually could include uh, joint systems and uh, data collaboration, data analysis, program monitoring, um, and evaluation and research. And lastly, this kind of joined us uh, at the end, is our own behavioral health and developmental disability services. OK? The Garrett Lee Smith Prevention Program uh, is involved in all four parts of that circle. Uh, but especially focuses on working with other youth-serving agencies in that section on interagency services. Um, and we do that on both a statewide level and on a local level. At the state level, we work with a variety of agencies to help set state policy, help them set internal policies, uh, help them develop comprehensive interventions. And some of the agencies that we work with in that, in that fashion are the Department of Education, the Division of Public Health, the Georgia Bar, the Georgia Department of Children and Families, which is our welfare agency, and the Department of Juvenile Justice, which we're focusing on today. So the evolution of our first three plus years of cohort four Garrett Lee Smith funding has given rise to our current uh, plan, which we're calling the CLASP program. And that stands for Comprehensive Local Awareness and Suicide Prevention. And so this class program has a number of different components to it. It is based on the recognition that youth don't live in just one system alone, that they interface with multiple systems. And in order to be fully effective at protecting those youth, you have to also interact with all those systems. And those systems are the welfare system, schools, their families, mental health service providers, hospitals, juvenile justice and law enforcement, medical examiners, institutions of higher learning, local coalitions, and faith communities. So we help our uh, 
uh, local counties develop their own local suicide prevention coalitions. And as part of that uh, support, we encourage them to invite folks from all these different areas, especially their local juvenile justice and law enforcement folks. So we'll ask them to invite the probation officer that's in their community and invite their local youth officer uh, and invite their, uh, their school-based uh, um, uh, officers. We also help to ensure that there are systems of care linkages because we want to make sure that uh, information flows along through all of these communities along with their youth. So we encourage the mental health programs and the schools and the welfare department and the local juvenile justice folks to be in touch with each other on a regular basis about youth who are at risk. We also provide professional training opportunities regionally and we offer those to all youth serving professionals. We offer very multidisciplinary uh, trainings on working with at-risk youth so that we can attract uh, juvenile justice folks, uh, lawyers, and uh, law enforcement officers in addition to uh, your, your general mental health prov providers. And then there's a school-based component to the services because youth are in schools most of the day. So we help with policy and protocol development in local schools and those focus on prevention, intervention, and postvention. We help with staff training, a gatekeeper training for schools, and student training to help change social climate in schools. And now we're going to start to focus on um, how we have built and uh, enhanced the relationship <laughs> and continued and sustained the relationship with the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice actually was formed in 1992 um, and was first called the Department of Children and Youth Services. And prior to that, it was a, a division of a bigger uh, component uh, in our state, a bigger agency in our state. I think it's important to know that our state has its own Department of Juvenile Justice so that we can actually interact uh, kind of on a state level, department to department, and that's had a lot of advantages. Um, the Office of Behavioral Health Services within the Department of Juvenile Justice was formed in 1998 when the state of Georgia entered into a mem memorandum of agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice. And there was actually a class action suit against the Department of Juvenile Justice around uh, the care of youth in its system. And so uh, a big piece of that was that it was important to get behavioral health services into the juvenile justice department. So uh, from October 1998 to July of 1999, policies were being developed and mental health staff hired for all of their facilities. And the relationship after 1999, um, 2000, um, really began between the Department of Juvenile Justice and um, our Behavioral Health uh, Department. And <clears throat> over the last 10 years, I feel like this is important on a general mental health um, uh, Department of Juvenile Justice level, there's been a lot of back and forth and work together. But there had not been specific emphasis on suicide prevention. So when the Garrett Lee Smith uh, program came into existence, that's when um, we really began to focus on suicide prevention. Okay, so this is how we began by working together. Um, the first thing that we did was to invite the DJJ commissioner to send a representative to our Garrett Lee Smith Advisory Committee for our grant um, before we even started any of the activities. And then we invited... Um, no, we didn't do that twice, actually. I'm, I'm sorry for yeah. that typo. <laughs> but, but they... Um, actually came and uh, we asked the representative um, who, who was uh, our representative at DJJ who we should meet with and ask them to host a meeting um, within DJJ where we could share the program. 
And at that point, we listened to them talk about um, their development, what their needs were, and then we offered to help. And that was the beginning of our ongoing relationship. So as we started meeting, um, we set monthly meeting dates and uh, started to develop an agenda with input from both sides. Uh, the first uh, couple activities that we did were activities that uh, they had suggested that they could use some help with, uh, reviewing their new employee training uh, in suicide prevention. So we attended that training and offered some feedback and some new statistics for them to include. And then doing some research on their annual in-service training where they update their staff. And we developed a, a survey that we administered to their staff and brought back some data for the juvenile justice uh, managers so that they could see just what the attitudes were of their staff and whether they had retained what they learned about suicide prevention in their first uh, initial training. And after that, we decided to offer a suggestion of something that we thought would be helpful, which was to take a look at all of the policies and protocols that they had in place and to document them. We started by following Lindsay Hayes' framework as a guide and as we started the process of uh, identifying and documenting what those policies and protocols were, um, we identified some gaps that were there. And you know, because we're uh, one to actually get down and, and work instead of kind of thinking about work, they decided, you know what, we need to fill those gaps, so let's put this aside. So they decided that they wanted to fill the gaps of treatment. And so we first attempted to look for some some work uh, to treat uh, at-risk youth who are who are youth who are at risk of for suicide, and they turned to David Jobes in Florida, who came up to Georgia and asked uh, and worked with them to develop a, a, a system where they could use his uh, his CAMS uh, uh, work. And then after working with those youth, what they found was that the clinician said, "Great, we love this, but we're having a hard time determining which youth are suicidal and which youth are." Uh, are engaging in non-suicidal self-injury. So they turned to uh, Dr. Nock up at Harvard, and he came down to Georgia and helped them to develop uh, uh, an assessment tool and some treatment uh, for non-suicidal self-injury. Which brings us to where we are today. Uh, right now, uh, we've gone back to offering to them uh, some training in using the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And right now, we're working on helping them decide who should be trained uh, in using that screening tool. And we're also going to bring some evidence-based practices for their clinicians, things like safety planning, uh, which Barbara Stanley um, and Greg Brown, Greg Brown have uh, developed. So um, now we're going to be talking about our future plans. You can kind of see from the last slide that um, it, it's actually our agenda um, that drives our work um, and that we actually get down to, to doing joint work. Um, and so what, what we have talked about in terms of future plans are, are several things. The first thing um, that we've talked about is extending the, this suicide prevention partnership that operates in the facilities into the community with young people who are associated with the Department of Juvenile Justice who have not been incarcerated. Um, and so uh, that's a, a very important next step um, and, in, and requires involving a whole new group of people uh, in our work. Um, Future plans are just continuing um, the consultation uh, that we have on, uh, on a monthly basis. I think this has been very valuable to both of us, um, both agencies. Uh, documenting our efforts, I think we really do want to go back and take a look at the protocols and the policies and the relationship to uh, Lindsay Hayes' seminal work. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing uh, that we have been talking about is building a similar relationship with adult corrections. And that's important because there actually are juveniles in adult correction facilities and also because um, 
we're, we're interested in working with the adults as a whole. So finally, to sort of uh, wrap up uh, what we wanted to share with you today, um, there are some lessons that we've learned over the last three years in working with our Department of Juvenile Justice. The first and most important one being that you can't operate on just your agenda. If we had written a Garrett Lee Smith grant where we were going to offer some program to juvenile justice and hoped to get it involved, um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't really work that way, at least here in Georgia, to come to somebody and say, we've never met before, but why don't you do this? Uh, so we needed to have that agenda come from juvenile justice, especially in the beginning while the relationship was being built. It's also important that the relationship is long term, <laughs> that you're not uh, in and then, and then out, um, that it's regular and that it's based on a give and take. And it's important that they have control over their own systemic changes. Um, you know, we offer a lot of advice but ultimately, they have the knowledge of what's going to work best in their community, and, um, and we listen to that. They have lots of data also to guide where to go next, but they often lack the resources to analyze it. So they collect a whole lot of mental health data, a whole lot of data on the youth that are involved in their facility, all the assessments that they do. Um, but they, they don't often have the ability to, to really um, pour through it. Uh, so one way that we can help them is to, is to take a look at the data that they do have and help them to analyze it. And then finally, we learn a lot from them too. Uh, the relationship that we have with them helps inform our work with other child serving agencies. Uh, we take from what we do with them over to our work with the Department of Child and Family Services and over to our work with the Department of Education. Um, but it's taught us a lot about building a collaborative relationship. So thank you very much for giving us the time to present this to you today. We really appreciate it. Adam and Sally, thank you so much. That was a fantastic overview of how the relationship um, has developed and um, and really, uh, you know, been sustained over time um, you know, between the state mental health um, agency and the state juvenile justice M agency. And just, I think, provides a great example of, um, of what you need to, I mean, I think that, you know, so many of us who are in the field, um, and I think all of our participants today um, have an understanding about relationship building and, you know, um, do that in the communities where they work. Um, but when you're sort of looking at some systems with very different cultures and, um, and where it's been, um, you know, historically it can be really hard to build that relationship. I think that hearing you break it down um, into some of the steps that were taken in order to make sure um, that that relationship um, really had a strong foundation um, to it is a really useful um, way for people who uh, already have those relationships in place or are looking to get them into place. So we have another um, discussion question. Uh, Dominique, if you want to bring up um, that view. Okay, so um, our next discussion question um, at this point uh, is who do you um, think that you need to work with to start a partnership with the justice, uh, juvenile justice agencies um, that are in your state or community? And this is a question um, where we'd love to hear from the people, again, who already have relationships um, that are in place and have been doing this work, um, or the ones who, um, who haven't and, and are looking to do that and, you know, maybe already have some ideas um, in place, have their eye on, on some um, key folks, uh, key stakeholders. Um, or have just started to brainstorm um, a bit about that. Um, so we'd love to hear from you um, in the chat box. I see that um, Jackie is in the process of typing and love to hear from, um, from anyone um, else who's out there who wants to weigh in um, on that. I know, you know we heard quite a bit from Adam and Sally about um, how, you know, how there are different um, folks who are involved with the efforts that are happening um, in Georgia. I see that there are a couple of people typing right now, actually. Okay. Um, so we have a few people um, who Jackie um, has listed. Thanks for doing that. Um, and she's talking about um, enlisting the, um, the help and support of the tribal police, tribal courts, um, the Attorney General's office, um, and the American Indian Liaison. So for um, people who are working in um, tribal settings, you know, those are certainly key people um, to be involving 
um, in this initiative. What others? Just kind of like sitting here watching um, people type, but um, but waiting for their responses to pop up um, here. I'm thinking too about. Um, you know, I think for those of us who are working in public health or mental health settings, um, it can be really easy to start identifying people, um, you know, that we want to work with in, in juvenile justice. But I think it's also important to think about who else um, working in mental health or public health is important to bring to the table to who might be able to fill um, a certain need. So I see um, that Adam and Sally chatted in that it's important to start from the top um, with a department commissioner um, and also so um, working from the bottom up, so thinking about local law enforcement and probation officers, I think that that's a really excellent point um, here to really, um, you know, be able to approach this from not only a leadership level, um, but also the people who are doing the work on the ground um, as well. Um, and I see that um, Gina Redness has chatted in um, about connecting um, with diversion programs, um, mental health, school administrators child welfare providers um, and Indian Commission as well, which are great suggestions. Um, and Nancy from New Mexico talked about um, using data from child death review um, as leverage when um, they went to talk with the director of CYFD, which I'm guessing, I don't know, Nancy, maybe <laughs> you could spell out that acronym. Um, I don't want to take a, a guess at it and get it wrong, so I'll just give you a chance to Ah, children, youth, and families, thank you very much. Okay, so um, we have a couple of other people who are typing in, and then we'll go ahead um, and move on to, um, to Ligia's presentation. But from Scott Perkins, um, professional organizations, including any state um, juvenile justice association, absolutely. Um, and then Simone um, talking about, you know, tremendous partner um, possibly being a SAMHSA funded systems of care grantee um, in how that, um, that kind of grant program crosses over multiple agencies, um, which I think is another excellent example of being able to get a number of key stakeholders um, right at the table who are already brought together um, by the grant itself. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody else wanted to get a last word in um, edgewise. Or Adam, if you had anything that you wanted to add? I don't. I was just going to read out Deborah's last comment about Indian education programs and TANF programs. So temporary assistance for needy families. All right. Okay. Well, I think that'll wrap that part. Go ahead, Gail. Great. Um, so thank you, everyone, for chatting in. We really appreciate um, your engagement and, um, and think that those were all really um, great examples and suggestions um, at this point and, um, and clearly have a lot of people with experience in this area and some good brainstorming that I think will be really instrumental for the people um, who haven't started doing this work yet but really want to. So. At this point, um, I am going to turn things over to Ligia Williams, who is going to talk about the Shield of Care um, training that has been developed in Tennessee. So, Ligia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate SPRC uh, inviting uh, us to be able to share this information. And Adam, Sally, and Simone, I really enjoyed your presentations. They were most informative. Uh, in Tennessee, we are currently in our third grant cycle for a Garrett Lee Smith grant, and we've had uh, a Garrett Lee Smith continuously since 2006. Our second Garrett Lee Smith grant was called Tennessee Lives Count. Juvenile Justice Project. All of our grants we call Tennessee Lives Count something. Um, our implementation partners uh, need to be mentioned, Mental Health America, Middle Tennessee, uh, where the uh, uh, coordinator and the trainers were housed, Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network. If, uh, if you all haven't heard uh, about our network, it's um, one of the best in the country, and Scott Ridgeway is their executive director. And uh, Centerstone Research Institute was our evaluation component. Uh, 
Um, while we were planning for the concept for this grant, I need to say that I, I agree with everything um, that, that was shared by Adam and Sally. Uh, building relationships take time. Everything that they said is way on target. And we had been culling a relationship with DCS and the Office of, of Juvenile Justice for quite some time. Um, but our, our network, TSPN, as well as during our first grant cycle, had worked collaboratively with that department, providing different trainings, uh, had representatives on the TSPN network, as well as on the uh, uh, task force for the Garrett Lee Smith grant. Um, we did hold a number of meetings because we already had a relationship established. And like Adam and Sally said, um, we didn't say, here's what we need you to do for us. We asked them what they needed. And that is so key and critical. And I'm, and I'm glad that they uh, you know, mentioned that and shared that with you all. And what we agreed on that they, they thought would uh, be very useful for them and helpful was if we could provide assist to all of their staff and all of the state's YDCs. Um, the DCS commissioner was committed to this. She sent letters to all of the superintendents basically saying that she wanted every staff person, kitchen help, janitorial help, uh, counselors, teachers, guards, she wanted all of the staff trained in this. She told them that she recognized that that would entail overtime and that was okay because this was an important thing to do. We also agreed um, that we would provide suicide peer awareness uh, to the youth in the state's residential facilities. Now those are not secure facilities because um, I think everybody recognizes you can't use Garrett Lee Smith uh, funds for anyone who's incarcerated. But we did provide uh, the Jason Foundation's Promise for Tomorrow to, to youth in residential facilities and that was met with a, a great deal of, of um, uh, respect and to the point that uh, the YDCs are going to be using that curriculum for the youth within their facilities. We also agreed to um, provide QPR to at least 5,000 community individuals that might interact with these youth once they are released from uh, the facility. One of the things that we did that I think in retrospect was one of the key elements that made everything go as smooth as it did uh, was that we asked to have one of their leadership serve on our management team. Now that's our grant management team. And they agreed to do that. That really opened the doors and made that communication more effective. Um, that lady, as well as several other people, served on our, our statewide task force as well. To our knowledge, um, this project represents the first time that ASSIST has been implemented statewide with staff who work directly with JJ Youth in confinement. So we were real excited uh, to have that opportunity and to have the partnership uh, that supported that. It was through our evaluation process and, and focus groups with the staff in the YDCs after they had the ASSIST training um, that we learned that, that there might be a different way of looking at suicide prevention gatekeeper programs within a, a, a juvenile justice facility. One of the questions they were asked was to provide us feedback regarding um, the process of helping suicidal youth in their facility and the degree to which ASSIST the assist model related to their system. Um, we provide assist in a lot of different varieties across the state, and it's always received very positively because it's an excellent curriculum. And uh, the, the same thing was true here. But during the, the focus group, we began to get a lot of data that was accumulating that it became apparent to us that a specialized model for suicide prevention was needed, one that was a systems approach and one that took in the culture of the juvenile justice system. Our evaluator, listening to this feedback and using the evaluation, she was able to conceptualize the model uh, based on their feedback and, and garnered through the evaluation. And each of the components of the shield of care um, illustrates a concept that was identified by the staff as important for suicide prevention. I w do want to point out, I don't have a lot of slides, but the slides that I have uh, come from the 70 plus sides that are entailed in this curriculum. And the, the youth or the young people that you see are the actors that 
were in the uh, the video component of, of the Shield of Care. Uh, I do want to say that the, the Department of Children's Services and the Juvenile Justice Division has decided to use the Shield of Care exclusively in Tennessee. Um, this Friday, we're going to be hosting a train the trainer for detention facilities in Tennessee, and we have a, a good number of them coming to Tennessee. We didn't design the shield of care so that it would require a train the trainer. Uh, we designed it so that someone with a mental health background and some suicide prevention could read and study the trainer's manual and be able to provide that training. However, many of our detention facilities don't have mental health staff, uh, and there was a need to, to provide a train the trainer uh, for them. Uh, included in the Shield of Care is a trainer's manual, a, the PowerPoint slides with an embedded video, uh, participant workbook, wallet cards, posters, there's evaluation tools, and directions for use. Um, all of those can be found on the Department of Mental Health's website and can be downloaded and used free of charge. Uh, the only thing that we ask is that if people want to use it in other states that they comply with doing the evaluation, mailing it to me, and that kind of thing, uh, so that we can pursue uh, having the shield on an evidence-based registry. We want to keep up our evaluation. We had many partners. Uh, both locally and nationally. There's far too many to, to mention here, but I think it's very important to, to give special recognition to some people who were key in the development of the Shield of Care. Um, the first one I want to mention is Jennifer Lockman. She was our evaluator. She is the, the lady who was able to take what the staff was saying and conceptualize this new model, the Shield of Care. The second one is Jason Padgett. He, he was our coordinator. Uh, he's now with the Action Alliance, as Gail mentioned. Jason had the untenable um, task of coordinating all of the focus groups, uh, the work groups, having everybody come together. He contracted with a professional curriculum writer on the West Coast and a videographer on the East Coast and was able to keep all of that together while at the same time doing training uh, uh, to fulfill the, you know, the grant goals. The third person is Jill Hollingsworth, and she was with Columbia Care Services, and she was the professional curriculum writer. Jill did a wonderful job. She was able to take all of our work group information and put it into a professional document. And lastly, Richard Wilson with Outreach Arts. Uh, he uh, produced the video, Second Glances. It is uh, a remarkable video. Uh, Outreach Arts has won uh, some Emmys. They're best known for their Maple Street series. So the, the whole curriculum is very professional, and, and thanks go to those uh, four people in particular for, for the results that we have. Um, we also want to thank and acknowledge the programs and the community gatekeeper programs that paved the way for this curriculum, ASSIST and QPR being uh, just two of those. The Shield of Care is a, an eight-hour curriculum. It includes many interactive activities. The video that I mentioned, Sex Glances, uh, is embedded in different sections of the curriculum. The vignettes basically are different levels of suicide risk. Um, there's the uh, story cards. There's policy review. There are a lot of different kinds of interactive activities to reinforce learning. The um, first section of the Shield of Care is basically an overview of youth suicide, but youth suicide specific to juvenile justice. Um, we had a lot of research developing this curriculum for pages, but the one that we highlighted the most and used uh, was Lindsay Hayes' work. Um, we cite that work and his findings throughout this curriculum and used the uh, uh, the things that he suggested in terms of developing it. This, thank you, Gail, for changing that. <laughs> the, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I figured that that would come in handy you that so that, that you had the to visual to really this, speak to. <laughs> this is the Shield of Care model. And the first thing that you'll notice about uh, that model is the shape of it. It's a, a shield. Uh, the shape used to represent uh, the fact that most of juvenile justice staff in our focus groups saw their role as protecting youth from suicide. I'd like to think that most juvenile justice staff 
do see that as the role. Uh, the second layer of protection and the second thing that you'll notice in this model is those layers of protection. And the first one uh, is the system policy and procedures. If we're going to protect youth from suicide, what this curriculum focuses on in part, a lot of things that it focuses on, is the importance of staff knowing their policies and procedures and adhering to them. And that we see is one of the most uh, important protective factors and things that staff can do. Uh, the second thing uh, is staff connectedness to the youth uh, as a protective factor and helping youth feel connected to something as well. And the third protective layer is the staff connectedness to each other, their ability to communicate and network with each other. Inside um, the shield, you'll see that uh, there are different, these are actions that the staff take. And it's called the S plan. And it starts with C, the protect, the listen, the assess, excuse me, and the network. Uh, we tell our participants that you don't necessarily always start with a C, but for the sake of training, we always start with a C. What I'm going to do is go very quickly through the, the shield of care and these actions, because that's the, the true core of this training, um, is to do that. So um, Gail, we'll go to the, I'll go to the next one. Um, the core of, C, of the seeing component uh, is seeing and being aware of the increased risk of suicide among youth in a, a detention center. The seeing action uh, spends um, a fair amount of time going over the staff's reaction to suicide, their attitudes. Uh, there is an attitude survey as well as uh, many exercises related to that and group share and group discussions for that. The seeing action, uh, again, discusses the Lindsay Hayes study, um, one that Simone had mentioned, uh, that only 16.5% of youth who, who died by suicide were on suicide precautions. And the point of that information and much of the other information in this curriculum is the challenge to prevent suicide in youth uh, who aren't on precaution. The um, basic concept of seeing is that, that we can prevent suicide if we can clearly see the youth, knowing the warning signs, looking at the environmental risks, looking at access to means and, and other, other things like that. In seeing the whole child, this curriculum includes an understanding of common thought patterns typical to youth in a juvenile justice facility, understanding issues of attachment and the effects of trauma. And this is one of the many ways that this curriculum actually differs from many other community models and is its focus on this and, and other things that I'll mention. It also has a, a, a lot of discussion about understanding the barriers and the walls that, that youth build around themselves and helping the staff understand and see that whole child and understand uh, that child's history and, and how those barriers and walls could be their way of protecting themselves. Additionally, uh, seeing risk also includes uh, you know, identifying depression and other mental illnesses that increase risk. It is in this section that the first video clip happens, uh, and the picture that you saw on the seeing are the actors that uh, are involved in that first video clip. Um, in the participant workbook, there is structured exercises, questions for, for the group to answer, and then there's group discussion uh, and facilitated uh, trainers' discussion with that. Um, the larger group um, in each of the activities you know, serves as a repository for asking questions and getting folks to think about their answers. For example, uh, in the first video that's on the seeing section. If um, any of the participants didn't come up with uh, the terminal statement, the uh, trainer might ask something like, did anyone catch the terminal statement? So there's a facilitative process that goes on with this whole thing as well. Seeing the environment is also an important uh, thing for the staff to be aware of. Uh, it's, it's critical. Participants are asked, uh, and, and we write it on a flip chart, to identify all potential ligatures and anchors in their workspace and in the facility itself. 
Um, and that's something that we share with the administrator of the facility, and sometimes it's things that they don't think of. Uh, we go over the, the different ways that, that youth can kill themselves in the facility, uh, drowning themselves in a toilet. That has happened. Um, hanging themselves from the, the springs from underneath the bed. And a lot of people don't think that that's possible, but anything 17 inches or higher, uh, a youth can successfully hang themselves. Um, lastly, this section this is concluded with the, one of the first youth story cards. Again, uh, there's different uh, questions, and uh, they break into groups. And we, we use all of these activities to really reinforce the, the learning. I'm clicking. The next section uh, in the S plan action is the protecting. Once suicidal risks identified in the youth, um, that's when we need to protect that youth's immediate physical and as well as their emotional safety. And this is another way that this curriculum differs because it does focus on uh, protecting the youth's emotional uh, safety. The types of protection that uh, are offered, we, do, we share this, you know, differs depending on the, the role in the facility. For example, you know, a non-security staff will protect a youth's immediate uh, physical safety by calling uh, security. So we go over a lot of those different kinds of things. Again, um, this is such a brief overview because it is an eight-hour curriculum. I hope I'm getting the highlights. Uh, protecting may also mean intervening in an actual uh, attempt. Um, so we go over you know, the things that they, they should be aware of, and most of them we found in our pilots uh, were aware of lifting the person up if they were hanging and, and that kind of thing. Um, staff also need to protect the use of emotional safety, particularly around high-risk periods and confinement, such as an upcoming court date, uh, and by choosing private places to talk. So we go over those kinds of things. Uh, in regards to protecting, uh, in this section, we review steps to be taking uh, when a youth is discovered in the, in the process of, of attempting suicide by other means. We ask them to uh, have an emergency kit and the, uh, uh, a response kit and a rescue tool. We found that in some of our facilities, all the staff knew how to use the rescue tool, but in other facilities, only the guards had it. Uh, and they have, since we've done a training, changed their policy so that all staff are, are trained to use that rescue tool. Um, in regards to uh, protecting the emotional safe, safety, pr the participants are provided with information on how to increase their connections with the youth and why that's important, and how they can help reduce the stress for the youth under certain situations. The next one, I see uh, we're getting close to the end, is is the listening. Um, one of the once the youth safety is protected, and then the staff need to listen actively and empathically. Um, this is very typical to many gatekeeper programs. Um, quite a bit of time, however, in this curriculum is spent <coughs> identifying uh, youth and, and looking at ways to, to give feedback. So listening skills are practiced, reflective listening, paraphrasing, and that kind of thing. And that's another way, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, that this curriculum differs. The Shield of Care helps staff, um, I think, understand the difference uh, and how different roles do the different uh, functions that they have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, but how they have to work together as well. The um, next section is assessing. Um, Assessing is uh, viewed from several perspectives, and it's highlighted in the Shield of Care um, that assessing isn't just a one-time occurrence, um, that vigilance needs to be an ongoing type of thing. So in the assessing area, there's uh, the difference that's highlighted between an informal assessment of risk versus uh, what the, the mental health professional might do. And, and the role and responsibility of each of the staff. In all of these different areas of the S plan, uh, there, there are policy reviews as well. The 
last section is networking. Networking uh, goes over the importance of that communication between staff and roles. We had some very interesting uh, things happen when we were, were doing the pilot trainings uh, on this. The very last section uh, in this curriculum is uh, an after an after a suicide, uh, and it goes over things of uh, critical incident stress management, the kinds of uh, responses that staff and youth may have, what signs to look for. It also goes over mortality reviews and liability issues uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, I see that my time's almost up, so I want to go to the very last slide uh, where you will see the, the website where if you are interested in the shield of care, it's available to anybody in any state. Um, you can uh, look at that, uh, look through the trainer's manual, see if it works for, for you or individuals in your state. Um, if you want to become a trainer, uh, just contact me. Uh, another way, uh, probably the easiest way of pulling this up, because that's such a long website, if you just went did a search for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health, You'll get their main page, go to their site map, map, and go all the way down to the bottom, and you'll have the shield of care. And it's very easy to find either way. So I think I did it, Gail. I think you did, and that was fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Slidea, for describing shield of care to us. Um, we're going to move to a brief question and answer. I'm going to invite uh, anyone who has questions for any of the speakers. Um, from today, Simone, Adam, and Sally, and Legia, um, to go ahead and please do that via the chat box for questions on the right, just as we have previously. So I think um, while we're waiting for people to chat, and I see that um, we've got somebody typing um, at this point, uh, you know, one of the things that we can think about, and, um, and any of you um, who are out there who are either doing this work or who are um, considering or, or definitely wanting to do this work um, can think about is, you know, some of the barriers um, that you may have already run into or that you anticipate running into. Um, in connecting with uh, ju ju juvenile justice agencies, either at the state level um, or at the community level, um, and some possible um, ways that you see to uh, to get around those, and maybe some successes that you've already had. Um, so we've got one question here. That's sort of a question I was just going to put out for um, general consideration, but. We've got one question here, um, whether there are funding opportunities available for juvenile justice suicide prevention projects. Um, that is actually a great question. Um, I may defer to the larger uh, group of presenters. Um, if you know of any um, of that, Simone, I'm not sure if that's information that's available um, on the task force, um, or if that's been a part of the discussion, um, or that if um, Steffi Rapp, who's the contact um, at OJJDP, would be able to answer that. I would, I would think what we would want to do is pass this question on to Steffi at OJJDP okay. and see maybe if she can reply. Uh, maybe there's a way to include her response, um, send it to the folks who were on the call today. Okay. Uh, I don't know anything off the top of my head, but I'll continue to think through this as we're, as we're on the webinar, and if I think of something, I'll jump in there. Okay. Um, this that is Sally. Uh, one of the strategies I think people could employ to look for funding is to talk with the juvenile justice agency because there are there's a whole funding stream through um, juvenile justice um, that they really have access to. And um, it, it, they may be willing, you know, to, to write the grant for themselves um, and have, you know, have the suicide prevention work program work with them, some kind of joint funding. And there's certainly, I mean, you know, there are different grant programs that are um, administered that engage um, juvenile justice um, 
agencies um, and incorporate some suicide prevention um, initiatives in them. Um, yeah, I'm thinking particularly through um, there's some OJJDP um, grants that are out there. They're not suicide prevention specific, um, but certainly suicide prevention and sort of mental health and overall wellness um, is, is a part of that um, and also sort of working to prevent kids from becoming um, involved in the system um, in the first place. So doing kind of more upstream prevention, which also um, then affects rates of suicide um, and suicide attempts as well. So that certainly um, exists out there. Are there are other questions that people have um, for any of the presenters, either thinking about um, what you heard about the Action Alliance Task Force um, on this subject, um, any of the forthcoming products um, or the subcommittees, um, what you heard about from um, Adam and Sally in Georgia about the relationship between um, the state agencies um, of juvenile justice and mental health, um, or from Ligia on the curriculum. And I, I work with Tennessee, so I know about um, how much of a labor of love this was. And, and I know we've got Jason Paget um, on, and you know I, I know he can certainly um, speak to his experience. Um, but you know I, I know that this has been a long time um, in the making, and that there um, it was very hard um, to condense. Um, you know, a, a full description of the training itself um, into a 20-minute period um, of time. But I think that Ligia did give um, a great overview. But if you had questions of, about any of those components um, or sort of what, what led to the development of the training itself and how you might be able to use it um, in your state or your community, um, now is, is certainly the time. Um, and if, you know, we'll give people a couple of minutes, um, maybe less, to chat in. Um, I know we're also, you know, about out of time. Um, so if there aren't any further um, questions, we can certainly um, wrap up. But Adam, maybe we can give people like a minute or so. Okay. All right, all quiet on the chat front. Oh, Karen Davis typing in here. Karen says, thanks. Well, thanks for joining. That's actually a great segue, very simple. Thank you. Um, Dominique, if we could just go to the next slide. I'll just share our contact information. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us on the webinar today. And um, the contact information is up for both Gail and myself. Um, if you'd like to contact us about uh, anything that you saw today, as we had said before, this